today we're going to be talking about the Star Wars Special Editions. Overall thoughts on the Special Editions. John? I respect the idea of them, that George Lucas, this is his, this is his art, this is uh, the things that he created. And if he thinks they're not finished, then he has every right to keep working on them as much as they can. My personal opinion of them, I don't mind them at all when they don't affect what I consider to be the tone of the movie or character. And then once they do that, whether it's interrupting the flow or it's something that I feel doesn't fit with the rest of the movie or if it changes a character's uh, definition, I guess, then I then I get like bothered by it. But for the superficial stuff, like the computer graphics of like X-Wings and stuff like that, I think it's pretty cool. Bracey, overall thoughts on the special editions? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to be speaking for three different Bracey's. Uh, the Bracey that uh, uh, experienced it when they were coming out or around the time that they were coming out, uh, the Bracey as becoming a filmmaker and a Star Wars enthusiast uh, 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 in college and now, uh, like, later 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 in life bracy uh and i uh the first one i would say uh, i was just like it was just a mate like just nothing but just pure joy getting to see star wars in the theater like just that in and of itself uh made any changes just amazing to me uh, back back in in that time like watching um, the phantom menace for the first time Exactly. It was just like nothing but uh, uh, speaking to the part of me that had been longing to get more Star Wars and that not just any Star Wars, uh, uh, but Star Wars uh, in on the big screen and being able to watch it with a crowd like never. I, I never got a chance to experience that because I came out in 77. I was alive. Um, but then in college, I remember uh, 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 with the two of you kind of. Uh, uh, thinking about it and uh, uh, kind of digging into it a little bit more and th just like kind of being a little like, eh, this kind of sucks, you know, <laughs> a little like, you know, like, oh man, they really revised the, they added these components and, 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 and maybe it wasn't necessary to this point that I felt like it was like, uh, I dreamt of a world prior to uh, them being affected because I, re I realized like they were erasing history. Um, mm. but then, but now, you know, I come, I, I look back on it and, uh, I, I still have the fond memories and kind of similar to what Johnny said, like, yeah, like you're, you know, you're an artist, you're gonna, you're gonna take every opportunity you can to revise, uh, what it is you were trying to do. Yeah. I generally agree with what both of you said. Um, was this the first time you saw Star Wars in a theater, like your first theatrical experience with Star Wars, because I know it definitely was mine. Yeah, I had no choice because of our, because of our ages, you know, what, what are we, uh, 81, 82, 84? So like by the time yeah. we were old enough to see movies in the movie theater, at least to remember them. Yeah. I mean, I had no choice but to wait to the special edition. So it was like a, it was like Woodstock, man. Like I, I remember, uh, I remember me and my friends skipping, like we were, we were doing Joseph and the Technicolor Amazing Dreamcoat, whatever, in like eighth grade. And I remember we skipped rehearsal to just go see the movie as right after school. <laughs> like we just could not wait until like nine o'clock that night. We had to go see it at like three or four o'clock in the afternoon because we had to go see it. And um yeah, it was it was probably the most exciting uh, movie moment of my life, uh uh just being able to go see it in eighth grade. Cause I grew up watching it on vhs you know so to see it in the big screen is like going to mecca it was like it was insane yeah you know it's really funny because i was watching the trailer for the special editions again which i remember very vividly and the trailer was specifically talking about the three of us the way they frame it is it starts out for an entire generation people have experienced star wars the only way possible on a tv screen and if this is the only way you've seen it then you've never seen it at all and then the x-wing like flies out of the tv and like blah 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 i remember that and that generation is specifically talking about us. We are the mm -hmm. generation that grew up loving Star Wars, but we didn't see it in the theater. Yeah, right? they knew what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. My dad has told me the story multiple times of when uh, he went to see the first one in the movie theater for the first time when it came out. Uh, they went on a double date, my parents and uh, their friends. And he said uh, him and his buddy were arguing over who was going to drive the car home because they wanted to pretend they were like in a spaceship. like. That's how like ants they were after seeing the first Star Wars. And it's like to just 
to know that I could possibly share in that experience, even though I've already seen the movie, is just something that I couldn't, I could not fathom what's going to be able to do. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I was kind of amped about a couple of things. Like this was really like the intro, they started introducing CG characters, right? Like CG yep. elements into, not necessarily just characters, but elements into uh, 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 the films, which was kind of heralding this new era, you know, because yeah. Uh, it's like, oh, oh, I know, I know uh, uh, CG has been in since the 80s, but for whatever reason, uh, uh, them doing that um, uh, just kind of made it feel like, oh, something new is coming. And then also um, there was this new arrival of toys that was, were happening at the time, mm -hmm. like, like this new uh, crop. And, and I just remember uh, specifically because they added certain new lizard Car like lizard uh, creatures that the stormtroopers were riding that like i remember that those things were becoming toys i just remember yeah. certain times to some of the cg content yeah. that i thought was interesting. yeah there were two things that you reminded me of the star wars behind the magic cd rom that came out around then that had a couple of behind the scenes featurettes of the anatomy of a dewback was one of them and then also i remember on fox they had this one hour special with howie long he hosted it called Star Wars, The Magic and the Mystery. I don't know if that rings any bells. You know, talking about Star Wars as a phenomenon, historicizing it. And then they were talking about the new changes in the special edition. And I was so excited for very similar reasons to what you were saying. I was also excited on this whole other level of like what it meant for filmmaking. So that said, were you aware of the concept of a director's cut or a special edition prior to these? Yeah, I, for some reason, I was aware, I think, of um, Blade Runner by that point. Because I think that, that came out in, like, 92. But for yeah. some reason, I, I was aware of director cuts because I remember, I remember the phrase at that time. But I don't quite remember what the first one was that I was aware of. The first one that I think I was aware of was the Blade Runner director's cut, uh, which I think is generally regarded to, to being responsible for the large-scale reevaluation of that film. I think so, too. And because it was so vastly different from the theatrical cut compared to a lot of other director cuts where it's like, oh, an extra five, ten minutes of footage, it was like, no, this is like, this changes the whole movie. Blade Runner wasn't really well-received, and it didn't do very good box office. So I think it was generally viewed as like a misfire or like a mm -hmm. flop but then the director's cut i think a lot of people they took a second look at it and you know that's the version certainly that i grew up with yeah yeah me too i don't even know if i've seen the theatrical version honestly i think i've only seen because at the time that the director's cut came out i don't think i'd seen blade runner and at the time yeah, after that right. had come out like that's the old, that's how it was always presented. I think exactly. Uh, I that's so. exactly how I saw it. Greasy, if you're, if you ever want to watch it, it's a good academic experience just to see how different uh, something can be with like studio notes and voiceover editing. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you buy Blade Runner on Blu-ray now, it's like they have the theatrical well, cut, the, the rough cut, the director's cut and the final cut, which combines the best of the theatrical and the director's cut. Um, the only other special edition that I'm aware of that was marketed that way, Close Encounters of the Third Kind had a really? special edition. Yeah, yeah, mm. because there were a lot of shots and a lot of scenes that Steven Spielberg didn't have the time to complete, and they re-released it in like 1980. And the studio agreed to spend more money to do the new effects and to finish the movie on the condition that he shoot a new ending that showed what was inside the mothership, mm. which Spielberg, I think, very wisely the first time chose not to not show you to what's show. inside the mothership. Yeah. But the studio was like, hey, we'll let you do all this other stuff if you, if you shoot this new ending. And at the time, he did it. And um, all the other stuff is great. The version that exists now, once again, it's like a hybrid without the ending from the special edition. Like that's like sort of the canonical version of Close Encounters that exists. I have to wonder if George Lucas was hoping or expecting that something similar would happen with Star Wars, where these new versions are the only versions that are going to be out there and the original versions will just become, you know, relics that nobody really remembers. Why do you think that happened to Blade Runner and not to Star Wars? Well, it's, it's all subjective, right? But I feel like um, the original version of Blade Runner 
was very much imposed on them by other people. So then when you see the, the director's cut and the final cut and all that, you can like, you're like, oh, this is like what it looks like when you're not confined to the studio pressure. Like it's, it's, it's artistically just better. I know it's objective. I know certain people like even Denis Villeneuve who did uh, 2049, he, he actually worships the theatrical cut because that's his version that he grew up with. But um, with Star Wars, they didn't impose anything on him. That It was like a true artistic vision. It was the best thing he could do at the time. And it shows. And I feel like with Blade Runner, when he does the, the, the special editions or the final cuts, whatever, he's refining it to what it already is. So like, uh, for instance, famously, the scene where uh, <clears throat> Deckard shoots Zora in the back as she's running through the place of glass. In the original version, it's clearly like a stunt woman with a really bad curly wig that doesn't match the actor's head, whatever. And the final cut, they go back, they get the actress back, and they, they, with subtle CG, put her face on the stunt woman, and they redo her wig, and it looks good. It looks better. It looks like, oh, this is what it looks like the way it was supposed to be. As compared to like the Star Wars special edition where all of a sudden Greedo says McClunky and shoots Han first. And you're like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> you know, like that like changes. Um, that's not what the original movie was, you know? So I feel like George is kind of like, oh, I have a new idea. I want to put it into the movie almost like it's like a remix. And then I feel like with Ridley Scott, he was more or less taking the chisel to the marble and he's getting out the kinks that were there to make the image clearer, if that makes any sense. I would say it, it has a lot to do with the perception of Star Wars. Like Star Wars, when it came out, it was a phenomenon as the, the theatrical release. So that that theatrical release um, became just the heart of how people just got introduced to the world and and uh, fell in love so if if blade runner was basically commercially a flop uh, uh compared to the, the to to the director uh the director's cut i feel like people accepted star wars for what it was and um and there were and i would argue that there were a lot of things that maybe got through uh a uh, through to an audience that maybe george didn't intend and so yeah. when he went back to make these special editions, he was trying to tell the story that he had been trying to tell. But I feel like more of the uh, the fan base and more of the of the world was like, "Yeah, that's nice, George. I really like stuff. <laughs> you know, like like I really like the mystery that existed in the world that you created because the things that you didn't." explain and i feel like that that largely influenced um how people refer to it so then when these special editions people aren't necessarily focusing on the fact that it's like oh it's it's the special edition oh uh, uh let's like elevate the special edition because ultimately i don't think the special edition elevated the experience for most people in the end yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And also you, you bring up something that I think we were going to probably talk about at some point, but Star Wars, in my opinion, uh, Star Wars to George Lucas is completely different as to what Star Wars is to the rest of the world. And uh, <laughs> so I, like, I think George has even said multiple times, like he doesn't even understood, he didn't understand why people loved it the way they did when it came out. Like to him, it's something different. So every time he does something to the special editions and adds another thing, it's like, is this really what you thought like it should be? Because it's so different from the way the rest of the world sees it. <laughs> you know, it's like you really want to, you really want to turn like this, this I don't know. Let's say like this this piece of opera into beach blanket bingo. Is that what you really wanted to do? I mean, I guess you know, like it's just one of those things where it's like oh, okay, like, we, we're not on the same page, you know? And that's the thing, like, when you're creating something, you have what's in your head, and then you have the end product, and then the audience has their own relationship with the work that you put out, 
that's completely separate from the one you have, and you're mm -hmm. the only one that has that specific relationship. So I think George Lucas has said at some point, he was like, he's the only the only person in the world who didn't get to see Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, basically, <laughs> he literally doesn't see what everyone else sees, which I think is an interesting way to think about it. What's also interesting is that I think it's the only piece of widely successful, hugely popular art that is constantly being reconfigured by the maker. I feel like most people, whether it be the Beatles or other movie makers or whatever, like they release it and then let it go to the world. And then if they go back to it, it's like they might remaster. Yeah, they, they might like take the mono mix and turn it stereo. But like that's basically yeah. it. They don't like change the lyrics to the songs or add like an organ when it was actually electric guitar. Like they don't like, yeah. they don't redo the song. So that's like a different song, you know, that type of thing. And I feel like he's made enough changes to the movies where it's like, they're still at its core, the same movie, but the, the things that he puts in are sometimes are like alarmingly jarring, <laughs> you know? And it's just like, but that's like, but then he's like, forget the old version. Which is weird because with the Blade Runner movies, it's like, watch whichever version you want when you buy the Blu-ray. But with us, it's like, I want a high quality version of what we grew up with. And it's like, you can't have it. Fuck you. And it's kind of like a weird sort of stance to take as an artist. <laughs> like, why can't you just give everyone the version that they want? You know, like, it's, you get more money that way. I don't understand it, you know? Um, and again, this is subjective, but I think the main reason why there's a lot of, um, consternation let's call it about the special editions is the simple fact that the original versions aren't available anywhere yeah these special editions which have been revised several times since 1997 there's the 97 mm -hmm. special editions and there were some tweaks for the the 2004 dvd release and then there were further changes for the 2012 3d versions that are the versions that we now have on on disney plus and on blu-ray and the only theatrically released the phantom menace in 3d right they scrapped the other one yeah after right that. right they released the phantom menace in 3d and that was right before the disney sale and disney had other plans for the theatrical distribution of the movies and i don't think the phantom menace 3d did really well so, I think it. I think it came at like the tail end of like the 3D boom, and I think at that point people were gonna getting annoyed at 3D. It didn't last very long, you know. Setting aside whether or not you think George Lucas should be making these changes or not, I don't think it's controversial to say that they're a bit of a mixed bag. Yeah, in terms of <laughs> like how successful some of the changes are, what do you think is the worst change? <laughs> we can't see it in the podcast, but Bracey is somehow in real life digitally altering his head to dodge a laser bolt like Han Solo from Greedo. <laughs> yeah, that would be the only uh, one change. That was the one thing that stood out to me that was like, oh, go, go. no, um, uh, 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 that I, I really, I, I really didn't like. And, you know, I'm, yeah, Han shot yeah. For all the way. So we're talking about. Greedo shooting Han before Han shoots Greedo. Yeah, indeed. I think I said this in the the Star Wars podcast. The refrain is Han shot first, and that's actually technically not right because Greedo never shot in the original. Han's one. the so only not, one that shot. Yeah, yeah. So it's not Han shot it's first. Han shot. Han shot. Yeah, yeah. Han, Han shot. murdered him in public in front of everybody. I buy the motivation that George Lucas explains about how like he doesn't like that it makes Han into a cold-blooded killer like I understand where he's he's coming from as an older man with three children I can understand not really liking that idea Greedo said he was going to kill him he said over my dead body and goes and Greedo is like that's the idea like I'm going to kill you is what he said yeah yeah so I mean he's, he's, def he's defending himself in a brutal way I guess what I'm trying to get at and it's kind of a slippery thing because full disclosure i'm in the middle of making changes to a film that i made to re-release and though you know my movie has one google plex the cultural impact of star wars like so so i don't think it's really a big deal but having the example of the special editions on my mind like there's like sort of a like an okay like i understand this isn't what i would do now so is this a change that is me now, how I would do it now? Or is this something that like really needs to be fixed in like a more objective way? 
it's hard to have the discipline to not make certain changes is what I'm trying to say. Like, you know, like once you start to go down that road, it's sort of on you to like decide what the rules are, decide what the guidelines are and stop yourself. Yeah, I think a lot of artists will agree with that. Um, a painting is never finished. Uh, a lot of filmmakers say if movies never done until it's in the theater, you know, like I think for a lot of people, like even a writer, you could probably do 20 redrafts of the same script, the same novel until finally your publisher is like, we got to release it. And then you got to just let it go. So I understand that. I understand how uh, the work is just kind of never done. But at a certain point when like it's out there, you know, like, like at a certain point, it's like you have to let go once it's out there and like, billions of people have consumed it it's like it's out there you know type of thing i mean you could do as many releases as you want but uh, you know how many times can you go back to the well before the public it's like how many versions of this do we need well that i think is the major difference like bracy was alluding to it's the cultural impact you know using the blade runner example blade runner arguably didn't work or didn't work as well as it could have there was a better movie in there Star Wars Whereas, was like a masterpiece as soon as it came out, the way the public perceived it. Yeah. The weird thing to me about, you know, sort of rewriting history of it all is like, it's sort of weird. Like, he's kind of saying like, no, like, you didn't see this. It's like a Jedi mind trick. It's like, that was not the movie. This is the movie that you should have seen or, yeah. or whatever. I mean, that's a separate issue from whether or not he has the right. I mean, he does. He has the right to do whatever he wants. But that's a separate issue from whether or not it is right the right thing to do. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say that uh, now, Bracey, it kind of looks at the situation as like, what's going on, George? What do you, what do you need? Like, you know, like, you like, where, where are you in your life? Like now that like you need to somehow go back in time and like kind of, uh, uh, right the wrongs that you perceive that like that then George was dealing with or like the limitations that he was dealing with. Like, I feel like uh, uh, to some extent, this idea that an artist should go back and uh, uh, like modify their art as opposed to take that and just move forward. Um, I think it, it, it says a lot. And I, and I think it also says yeah. a lot that George didn't really move forward. Like, I feel like, as far as movies are concerned, he really slowed the flow down as far as his, his production, directing, like as, as his involvement, what, what excited him, what he created, how he created um, the thing. I just feel like, yeah, there, like there was some emotional things tied up in that, that I just feel like, you know, had, had we seen him grow as a human, he actually probably would have just been like, oh yeah, there's no point in going back and changing these things and re uh, uh, revising it because kind of to what Johnny said, it's like, it's out, it's there. The people, the people have received it. The message has been sent. Like now you're just like sending noise, honestly, to some extent you're just sending like, well, no, no, it should be like this. Ah, wait, 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 I got an idea. It should be like this. <laughs> and like, and you're going to do that for the, for eternity. And then uh, to some extent, that's what you're going to start to be remembered for as opposed to the actual things that you create and growing mm -hmm. with your art. I think the hyper-specific change of McClunky kind of speaks to that where it's almost like McClunky. he he made this controversial change to Han Solo. Greedo shoots at Han. Han dodges the laser and shoots Greedo in self-defense, which is not what the original was, was. And he keeps doing it. Every change... Every time they release the movie, he he does something with that scene. And then finally, in the latest release, for seemingly no reason that anyone can comprehend, before the shootout happens, it just cuts to Greedo and he goes, my clunky. And like, that's not even an English word. <laughs> like, And like, it's some alien thing. And then it happens. And to the extent it's like, well, did that make your movie better? Like, and it's, it's like, at that point, is he just being like, hey, guys, I put a silly hat on the statue. Isn't it funny? And it's just like, yeah, I guess. Like, what is like, and to what Bracey's saying, it's like, 
it's like George, like what are you what are you trying to do here? Like it's not even like it's not even like I'm insulted or angry at it, but it's just more or less like I'm just like confused. Like what is why do you keep doing this? You know, like just leave it alone. Leave it alone, you know? Here's my reading of the whole McClunky thing, because he's he's done this with a few other of the special edition changes. He's tried to fix the change to make it work a little more smoothly. And I think what McClunky was an attempt to do was like showing Greedo saying something that was threatening that would justify why Han would have his gun ready. I mean, the whole conversation would justify why his gun is ready, you know? When he's literally like, I'm going to take you back dead or alive. You know? No, what I'm saying is like why he knows Rito's about to shoot him. Right, right. Because he, and so he gives him an angle exclamation, which is the equivalent of like, you motherfucker, which is like, oh, he's about to pull on me. We're about yeah. to have a shootout. Look, that's what yeah. I think the thinking behind yeah, McClunky yeah, yeah. is. But, but I mean, it's like, like did that he's... need to be clear? It's like, did that need to be any more clear than what it already was? Like, were we as an audience confused by that scene? Were we well, like, well, I don't understand why Han shot Greedo. It's like, I got it the first time in 1977. <laughs> no, but that's the thing. It's like what I said before. Like, as an older yeah. man, as a father of three. Yeah, he, he wanted to be want, an even he, more of a good guy and not a cold. Yeah, like, he ever. doesn't want Han Solo, who he knows becomes the beloved hero figure that he is. He doesn't want that to be someone who shot someone in cold blood. And I just want to speak to that real quick because speaking to this as a as a as a father, um I I understand that desire to like, oh shit, I don't want to look like an asshole in front of my kid. Like, you know, like <laughs> yeah. I don't want my kids to realize how fucked up I was as a human being and like uh, as an underdeveloped uh, uh, male mind uh, crafting things that left artifacts of how fucked up I was like, yeah, I don't yeah. want that. But that to me is also that, that thing of like, Hey George, what's going on? Like, I want to like, like what the, mm -hmm. what you should really be doing here is reconcile with the fact that like, yeah, that was effed up. But there's something actually more beautiful that you could probably do by just owning up to the fact that that was flawed as opposed to changing yes. the flaw in the in the past. But just like play it forward, show them how to grow from the from. The yeah, mistake. I agree with that. Showing the growth, showing the change in the thought process, yeah. because if you just make this change and pretend that that's what it always was or you erase what the original was, then you erase the the evidence of the growth it's like oh yes. he started here but then later on he changed his mind about that so we can see mm -hmm. the the progression and actually Gracie, you hit on something that i never thought of in this way what you're talking about when you say george lucas should reconcile his relationship with these films and let go that's sort of what he has be the reason for for Anakin slash Vader's downfall is that he has these attachments that he holds on to so hard and he can't let go. And mm. he wants to control everything and for everything to be his way. And he can't let go that he ends up destroying the things that he loves the most and that he fears to lose the most. It, it's mm -hmm. like poetry. It rhymes. Yes. To quote George Lucas. Yeah. I feel like him selling Lucasfilm to Disney was his way of being like, I have to get rid of this because he will just, he will be a slave to it forever. And even then, after that happened and then Force Awakens comes out, famously, he was in the interview, he was like, it's like I sold my kids to white slavers or something like that. And it's like, he still, he still couldn't quite let go of like what his, what his thing was, even though he already did, you know? Well, that's something that I really understand though. It's like the selling of your life's work and then seeing somebody else like do something totally different with it yeah like that like that i i totally get yeah i don't fault him for, yeah no no i'm like, not i'm not feeling faulting some him kind right of way I'm, I'm just saying like it it just goes even further where it's like you're saying how uh the art imitates the life with uh, revenge of the sith a little bit and i'm just saying that the, the life even has like some of that too where it's like he's he's trying to let go but he's still he's still there in some capacity you know like but How we he... also won't let him go. Like, you know, yeah. I, I feel like as a community, like this right now, true. we're literally talking about him in the context of Star Wars. And <laughs> and this dude stepped away to the tune of billions of dollars. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like we could stop talking about him, you know, but but as a community surrounding the culture, we won't separate the two. And so he will respond 
when prompted enough. We also won't separate the two until he moves forward and gives us other stuff that has nothing to do with Star Wars. He needs to. I mean, I, I, mean, it, I don't think he, he has to do anything. No, yeah, no, I mean, no, like, no, no, no. But I, not, I, I don't mean that like he has to follow. Our, I, I mean that in the sense where it's like if we as a society are going to separate George Lucas more from Star Wars than he is, then he needs to have other output than Star Wars. And right now, he basically people know him for Star Wars, American Graffiti, and THX. And, and Indiana Jones. Star Wars. And Indiana Jones, but Spielberg takes Indiana Jones more than Lucas, you know, because, uh, but what I'm trying to say, it's like his biggest, longest running contribution to all of his work has been like Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars ever since that happened. So you can't really fault society for being like, yeah, George Lucas, Star Wars. It's like, well, yeah, no, not, not, not everybody goes on to do wings after the Beatles or whatever. It's like, you know, like he just, he's just been Mr. Star Wars for like 30 some odd years. Yeah, no, I would argue there's nothing he can do at this point in his life career that he'll he won't be just completely tied to Star Wars. I would argue yeah. I would even argue that no one thinks of American graffiti and THX or Willow <laughs> or Indiana Jones or anything in general when like as a first response when you think of George Lucas. This I is think this people. is this is true. And I even mentioned wings as a joke, but when you say Paul McCartney, you're not like wings, you're like the yeah. Beatles, you know. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's yeah, just like that's right. just the way it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there any changes in the special editions you like? Yeah. I like what they did with the X-Wing fighters in the Battle of the Death Star in the first movie. I don't mind that. See, I actually really hate that now. That's that's fine. That's a subjective thing. But like, to be honest, if I had to choose one version to watch, I would only watch the theatrical version. That's it. Or the yeah. VHS version, whatever. But with the quality of HD. But my point being is that like, I don't mind it when they like go to the Battle of Hoth and they like made the canopies more opaque so you can't see through them like when they touch up the effects to make them look a little bit more smooth i don't mind that but stuff that made it better like i don't know if anything really made it better like i seen the wampa like chomping down on some like animal carcass was like eh, that's cool but like i didn't really need it you know i didn't need i understand why they uh change the Ewok celebration at the end of Return of the Jedi. I yeah. thought that was like, well, I guess that makes sense. You want to see the whole galaxy celebrating, like, but yeah. It I wasn't like, oh, this movie's so much better because of that. You know? <laughs> it's just like, right. oh, okay. Like it's just a different shade, you know, to me. All the good stuff are just different shades of what was already there. Yeah, I would say uh the well uh, 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 the thing that I celebrated at this time uh, when they started getting re-released is they also re-released the music. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yes. I, I don't know if they made any significant changes to the music, except for maybe like extending some areas where they extended a scene or something like that. Yeah. So like they like fluffed yeah. up an intro or something like that. But uh, uh, to me, diving back, diving into the soundtrack of the special edition i i even remember getting them as like gifts for for like for my birthday or something like that from friends but like um i i think that is when i actually just really connected with the music of john williams for star wars and not just the the like the anthem the intro or like whatever mm -hmm. like you know the big the big themes that everybody knows but like actually being able to play through and get an appreciation for the moments that like John Williams elevated with his music. Um, so I, you know, not that it was necessarily new, but I think music being reintroduced as like, Hey, listen to this. Uh, uh, that, mm. that was my favorite part of the, of the special editions. Yeah. And speaking of the music with, I mentioned the Ewok celebration, we all have a very nostalgic strong affinity for yub nub you know that song they sing but i don't mind the i don't like the new song they put at the end of return of the jedi i thought it was like fitting you know yeah and that's same. I, I was interesting uh uh to your uh point bracy to hear like new john williams music because of that so it was kind of exciting uh on that level it was probably more exciting than the special effect it's like oh a new john williams song you know yeah you know i think the real legacy of the special edition it's hard to conceive of now 
But I think what it really did was reintroduce Star Wars into like the popular consciousness in a real solid way, paving the way for the prequels and then the era of, of Clone Wars and all of that stuff in the 2000s. Star Wars really hasn't left the public consciousness since 1997. I think it maybe was starting to recede into the background right before the Disney sale. But in retrospect, I think the dark times, as it were, between the release of Return of the Jedi in 1997, like that's really when Star Wars was out of the public of the public mm -hmm. consciousness. Um, do, do you know how much they invested to redo these movies? Well, for, well, for the first movie, so initially they were only going to do the first movie because it was actually a restoration project. So 20th Century Fox approached George Lucas. They were like, the 20th anniversary is coming up. We want to do a re-release of some kind. And they went to the original negative and it was in like really bad shape. And they realized that they were going to have to do a significant restoration job on it, like in worse shape than a movie that age should have deteriorated. Ironically, probably because it was so successful. They kept making prints. Yeah, because they kept on having to strike new prints. So they already knew that they were going to have to spend a few million dollars. And then while they were doing this restoration, George Lucas went to 20th Century Fox and was like, you know, while we're doing this, like there are a couple of that always sort of bothered me. Would you consider giving me money to make some changes or whatever? So long story short, I believe they spent about $10 million, which is what the budget of the movie was originally. That's so um, funny. Though, if you think about it, once... The decision was made to make changes from a marketing standpoint. That's that's genius. Gold. Uh, mm -hmm. Because now all of a sudden it's not here's the same thing. There is some added value here. There's stuff in here that you've never seen. And I was actually excited for that when I was uh, a kid. Like when I, was I heard that they have all these new things. I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. New scenes, new whatever, you know, I was really excited. No, so was I. It really blew my mind. Like, it's so weird, the idea that there was such a desire on my part as like a 12-year-old or 13-year-old, like to really see those effects, like, you know, quote unquote, fixed or like modernized. Yeah. Because looking at some of those 90s changes now from the perspective of 2022, I would argue that the special edition changes have aged worse than the original 1977 effect. Yes. Yes, they have. The best example of that, I think, is that every time they re-release the movie, they have a new CG model of Jabba in the Jabba the Hutt scene. Oh, because like, yeah. if you look at the 97 version of that scene, the Jabba CG creature looks like something out of like a PlayStation cutscene. It's like not, yeah. it's like really not that great. PlayStation 3. I feel like every time they do uh, the prequels as well, they would do something to Yoda, you know? Like, I remember when um, they replaced the puppet of Yoda from Phantom Menace with the CG Yoda. And I don't know, like, I just have this feeling that, like, at some point, George Lucas might have had the brief thought in his head to go back to the Empire Strikes Back and make a CG Yoda just so he would be streamlined from the prequels to the original trilogy. And he didn't do that. So I, I want to thank George Lucas for not making Yoda CGI in The Empire Strikes Back because I have a feeling that thought went into his brain and he was probably like, nah, and just moved on. Well, I do think he, he he's thinking about this as consistently, or he had been thinking about this as the new viewers, like how are the new viewers coming into this, this as if somehow they're going to come into this as fresh, you know, as as the the people who came before like oh they're gonna find star wars and they're gonna watch through and they're gonna you know and they're gonna come away with this feeling and i, I can't even get my kids to watch star wars but <laughs> i've tried so hard they love uh they love the new shows they love mandalorian boba fett uh they love baby yoda really? uh, uh we've been watching visions they love the anime but like the movies oh they like ray like they liked uh oh they really like the last jedi uh, they can't jump on board for the other two. That's um, interesting. Yeah. That's so weird. So, I guess there's a very particular taste. So they don't run through it the way that, like, I think George imagined when he's re-engineering the flow, the experiential flow of the movies, because I think he's, like, trying to constantly make it for this next generation of kids who are going to enjoy it in a new way, when, in fact, 
that is not the actual user experience. Like, you know, right. if you fall into it, you're going to fall into it because of the culture that exists around it in which mm. it's going to come with its own kind of guidelines as to like, oh, this is how you experience Star Wars. Yeah, well, that's yeah. really interesting because like just from a pure, not even the the technology, but just from like a pure maturation of film and cinematic language, like when you go from Revenge of the Sith made in 2005 to A New Hope made in 1977, the style of filmmaking, the style of storytelling, the way that information is presented to you visually and the pace of it, the sensibility is so different from 2005 to 1977 and from, I mean, in my opinion, the prequel trilogy to the original trilogy in general, like the only way to accept it is to remind yourself that, oh, like these were made 25 years before the ones I just watched. So you already have to do that. I mean, I'd be very curious to like, you know, if I ever have the opportunity to actually sit down and ask him, like, I'm genuinely curious, you know, in George Lucas's mind, is he expecting a new viewer to be able to go directly from episode three to episode four without noticing the difference, <laughs> the change? Is he huge yeah. difference? It, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I feel like um, I don't know what style he was going after with the prequels as with the original trilogy with specifically with a new hope i feel like he's very much like okay i love kurosawa and stuff like that and you could actually see it in his movie you can see david lean you can see kurosawa you can see john ford whatever and then like um and then so you you feel like the the feeling of like the seven samurai and then when you go into the prequels He'll say like, oh, at this part in the scene with CGI Yoda, uh, we have him rub his head, which is just like the monk from Seven Samurai. It's like, yeah, you had him do that like the guy from Seven Samurai, but the movie doesn't feel like Seven Samurai. The movie just feels like, I don't well, know what. It feels like, it's like he's he's found a new style, but it's like, but I don't know if that style is just get the movie in the can or if he's actually going for something. And I, I still, I haven't, I haven't, I'm going to have to rewatch the prequels again, but like, I, I, I still haven't quite felt some sort of thematical visual aesthetic, if that makes any sense. Well, so you've hit upon something, I think, very interesting. Um, the reason that Yoda head movement doesn't feel the same as when Toshiro Mifune does it is, I think, because of the film and the camera and the lens and yeah. all of like that that quality of the medium He's actually itself. like a sweaty man who's actually rubbing his head for a reason so but the reason why it doesn't feel anything like what it is supposed to be paying homage to is that for all intents and purposes they're working in two different mediums like i feel like george lucas is pretending that the medium does not hmm. make a difference yeah, he, he's he's drawing with something different. He used to make oil paintings, and now he's using his tablet for on a computer. And he's like, they're exactly the same. It's like, it's not the same. It's not the same as an oil painting. It's it's something else, you know? Yeah, uh, the medium is the message. And so yeah. if the medium is the message, uh, uh, the medium itself dictates what can be communicated within the medium. And so you change the medium it changes what is being communicated. Exactly. And so I, I feel like that's, uh, uh, that is kind of something like kind of uh, in, in the lines of what both of you are saying. It's like, uh, uh, you've got a CG character without a lot of context that the medium inherently brought. Right, to exactly. The... Right. I was just going to say, in the original version, the irony is when he doesn't have a Seven Samurai moment in the uh, original movie, the movie feels much more like Seven Samurai just because of the aesthetic of what it is shot on film, yes, shot on location, right, exactly. it, shot in widescreen with epic, with epic landscapes and yada, yada, yada. You see Lawrence of Arabia and all that. And then he's like, hey, look at the CG Senate room in a crowded frame. And like, he rubs his head. It's just like Seven Samurai. It's like, this does not feel like Seven Samurai. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, I know you made like an Easter egg allusion to it, but like, and then my broader question is like, well, what is this movie supposed to feel like? And well, so, but like, that's the thing though. So, but that's the know, thing. Like, like, I feel like he, he's insisting it's the same. those. Yes. Because I feel like if he wasn't, then he wouldn't have shot the last two prequels on 
1080p video because they don't feel at all like the three movies that they're supposedly leading into. They feel like cut from a completely different cloth. Which can be fine if you want to do like 30 years in the past, the golden age of Jedi and like make it all different. But even then, like, okay, like, let's say he wants to make a complete departure with technology and aesthetics and stuff like that. Even still, it's like, I, I still wasn't quite sure of uh, what he's going after. And to, and to more to your point, uh, Josh, going back to the special editions, that idea that I think you have is sort of explains why uh, he might think that some changes are good ideas and that maybe the rest of us find it. I know it's subjective. It's all subjective. It's art. But like, uh, I think that's another reason why we might find it jarring if all of a sudden in the middle of like a, like I said, on location, 35 millimeter, like widescreen Coruscant or David Lean sort of moment. And then you cut to like a, Beavis and Butthead moment, <laughs> you're like, what? And then it goes back to like the thing, and it's like, oh, the the, the computer graphic quality of Java the Hot, or when you ask me what change would I like to get rid of, I have to flip a coin between either uh, Greedo shooting at Han first, or the whole Jedi Rocks dance number from Return of the Jedi, which I makes the movie come to like, that. <laughs> but like it, the movie comes to like a screaming halt. For yeah, like no, this does, Fraggle Rock dance number, and it's like, what the fuck am I watching? I and maybe like in it. his mind, it's like, <laughs> but like, but maybe in his mind, it's like, ah, oh, they're all they're all aliens and Muppets. It's all the same. And it's like, it's not. <laughs> like, it's just well, like, I, it's the theme and tone of the movie is totally derailed at that point. It's so interesting though, because given the technician craftsman of a filmmaker that he is, it's so interesting that he seems to have this one blind spot which he yeah. of all people should no. understand should see why there's a difference right yeah it's like it's it's a mon it's not like a subtle difference it's like a monumental difference you know like yeah it, it, the base understanding in film i think that thing that i learned to appreciate when we went to uh, uh the film school um or cinema school sorry it was cinema school cinema um at binghamton uh, cinema uh <laughs> uh is that the movie happens in the mind the motion happens mm -hmm. in the mind and i think the special editions uh started to show me where i had a different story in my mind than what he mm. had intended mm. to show and i and i now can only really appreciate the moments that made it it is those lines that it's like before the dark times before the empire how that was delivered how that sat how that yeah. echoed in my ears and allowed me to paint the picture of the past in a way that he could never have a brush fine enough to do for me and like and then he attempted it mm. <laughs> like you know and then he and then he tried to fill in the gaps in a way that he he had the hubris to think he could like actually paint the a uh, uh, paint such a grand scale and like you know before we celebrated him for that and he continued on that direction because mm -hmm. he was celebrate i mean i believe he was rewarded for attempting to do that but it was the cleverness in which he approached it initially where he recognized his limitation and allowed uh, allowed the moments to actually paint something deeper and more vivid by just giving it space to the right moments and and mm. I, yeah i, I feel oh, like that's where special edition started to show me it's like oh i'm not going to get what i want so well, maybe you're giving me an answer to what i was saying before like maybe with the I'm sorry. the take <laughs> god damn you answering my rhetorical questions <laughs> but um with that the technician's eye all he's seeing is the gulf between the intention and what the tools are able to render so so Execution the frustration yeah so the frustration for him and again, he's the only one on Earth who has this point of view of these movies. He's the only one who knows, yeah, like that's not what that was supposed to be. So what he he has done since making those original movies is, Brace, you said before, like he sort of retreated from the director's chair and from, uh, you know, making his own movies. What he did instead was he really sunk a lot of 
his time and energy and money into the R&D that created all of the tools that we all use now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, George. Yeah. Thank you, George Lucas. If you're listening, and I know you are, <laughs> I just want to use this opportunity, this very rare opportunity, because I know you're listening to say thank you personally. I saw this as like an internet comment somewhere, but someone said about the prequels are like, a lot of people don't understand that the prequels are basically like huge budget R&D like workshops for him testing out new software and technology. And if it weren't for the prequels, uh, we wouldn't have modern movie making the way it is. I mean, that is not wrong. Yeah. And I mean, everything we've said about the special editions at the same time, it's like, God bless him, because it's just like, this is a curious man who will not stop. Yeah. And it's like, keep going, man. I mean, like. We, we all we all want him to succeed and it's like and it's like and even if he like says, does stuff and we're like george i don't understand what you're doing this is ridiculous it's like well he's trying something you know and if it weren't for this we wouldn't be where we are now with uh, technology so you know god bless yeah. him i agree 100 percent. and actually sometimes i have hesitation even having conversations like this because I don't want to give the impression that I don't have the utmost respect for this man and his work. I know what you mean. I don't, that's why I'm bringing it up now. Cause I don't want to seem like we're ragging on him as much as it's just like we, we, we have our subjective artistic thought on it. And then we have like his contribution to society. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. yeah. And Wait, everybody's already heard everything we said. <laughs> yeah. He's a pioneer. It's, we can't take yeah. it back now. <laughs> we're part of the noise. We're part of the noise. But if you think about that, though, like if you continue on with this understanding of what he's trying to do, not seeing the medium as a part of the equation, then the special edition changes make sense. Like to me, I keep thinking of the changes in Mos Eisley where we see them go in and we have these huge grand shots, high up crane mm -hmm. shots mm -hmm. and everything is moving and it's a visual feast. One of the reasons it's so jarring is because stylistically, in terms of the types of shots, the kind of camera movement on either side of that, nothing else in the movie is is like that stylistically. Yeah. So what was like very classic Hollywood style, like establishing shots and coverage, and then all of a sudden you you inject these sweeping vistas with a moving camera and these like, you know, grand shots. There was nothing else in the movie like that. And I guess in his mind, he's... He's bringing them up to spec with the movies he's about to make. So it doesn't matter how much of that style is in there or not, because ultimately that's what the vast majority of it is going to look and feel like anyway, as soon as he makes these sure. three movies. I think the one rare moment where I think he course corrected a special edition mistake, it was um, The Empire Strikes Back, if you watch the special edition, and actually... To this day, when I watch The Empire Strikes Back, I tend to watch the one on Disney Plus because he made the least amount of changes to that one. Uh, you know, when I go to Cloud City, instead of seeing windows, you see like open air windows of the city and like, who cares? That's fine. But in the, when the original special edition came out, he had this glaring uh, misstep when, when Luke uh sacrifices himself to the pit after vader's like join me and we can be together and he falls down the vacuum of bespin he added like a scream almost like the emperor is like ah! you know and i remember when that first happened i was like what the fuck and then when other versions of the movie came out they took the scream out and i was like oh great he saw it. He was like, ah, that wasn't a good idea. And he took it out. And I, I respect him for that decision. So to this day, I still watch the Disney Plus version of The Empire Strikes Back because the, the, ver the changes of that don't bother me as much as like the, A New Hope and Return of the Jedi where I'm like, I need to find the theatrical yeah. because I can't feel. Do you think, and this thought is just occurring to me now, but do you think he didn't realize how much we watched these movies on VHS? Like, yes, that, like, <laughs> I think maybe there's a part of him that had no idea we had like memorized every frame of this movie. And like, the rhythms of these movies are like imprinted on my mm -hmm. my retinas. It's in my DNA to a certain degree. So so when I see a change in the movie, it just feels wrong. I think he knows to some extent that there are so many people. I mean, he's he got the paycheck, I'm sure he realizes people keep watching these films um, and keep buying them and keep talking about them. I think it is inconsequential to his, his 
need to express himself the way that he wants to clarify yeah the thought but mm -hmm. what in actual in practice i feel like he's just showing jaws like i feel like he doesn't realize that what made the made the movies what they are is what they didn't show and he is obsessed with showing things uh, showing making more clarity but the clarity is in itself like actually taking away from the mystique and the yeah. magic and the right. experience um uh, uh the way that that he he can't he he i don't think he he understood that he couldn't capture that by showing more like yeah. that's what i feel like is no is, but no but i don't think he understood care. that i think he was frustrated that that's all that that's the best he could do he, i don't know yeah. that he was like oh like since i can't show it i will have to do it like this and that results in something unique and interesting on its own like i think he was like no like this is not good it's not what I wanted. I think, I think both things are true of what you're saying because I think it has, I think it's tied to a sense of clarity as well. Because going back to what we said about McClunky and what you were saying, Josh, it's like, oh, he added the exclamation there to make it so that we know that uh, Golden Heart Han Solo must have yeah, like known. It'll feel more he, natural. Yeah. It'll feel more natural. And then likewise, uh, uh, to your point, Bracey, like, uh, as we've talked about in other episodes, like when um, Return of the Jedi, when the Emperor is killing Luke Skywalker, and you see the close-up of Vader's mask and the lights flashing on his face, and the music is swelling. In the original version, you just see the mask looking back and forth from the Emperor to Luke, and you can see that he's breaking, and the gears are turning, and we as the audience are projecting so much onto that emotionless mask, and we could feel all of his heart changing. So when he picks up the emperor silently and throws him down the pit, we're like leaping out of our seats and we, we felt it coming. We were like, Oh, he's going to yeah. do it. I bet he's going to do it. Pull. Yeah. There's he's like, I, to it. and as, and as an audience, this is something that we talk about in acting class too. Like the audience is doing half the work for you, you know? So if you take a moment, take your time in the scene to deliver your lines and really connect to your partner, your audience is like waiting with bated breath. Like they, they're projecting onto you their own lives and as we project onto darth vader we're projecting the the confliction on him but then in the special edition we hear him go no 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 and it's like yeah now it's more clear but kind of like to what bracy's saying it's like but then you kind of take away that like what we have to offer for, to the movie if that makes any sense like the audience participation goes out the window when you keep explaining like mcclunky and no and whatever it's just like you know, like even uh, I talked about how I don't mind watching the Wampa chop down on an animal before he goes to kill Luke. There's something to the element of like hearing the noises not and not seeing it. him. And you just see like the obscured shot of fur go by and you're like, what the fuck is coming to kill him? And that's scarier yeah. than it showing him eating an animal. You know, like, exactly what Bracey said, showing like the shark. Like Jaws and Alien, you yeah. know, don't yeah. show the alien, don't show the shark. Yeah. It's like, just keep it, keep it in your mind. Yeah. You know? and, but that uh, also just, that makes me feel that he didn't understand what like it shows that there were things that maybe he got by as a as a filmmaker because of the times that the limitations actually worked to his advantage in a way that he didn't actually get to grow as a filmmaker like he didn't get to grow from some of the lessons because his focus wasn't on hey Oh shit, that worked. His focus was on, man, I didn't get to say the thing that I wanted to say. And I feel like yeah. that dramatically affects the, affected the art and his growth and, and the output and what we've seen since. It's almost like the difference between him and Spielberg because Spielberg made Jaws and he's like, oh, I've learned a very valuable lesson with this movie. <laughs> And then he grew as a yeah. filmmaker from there. And Lucas is like, fuck, I got to remake Jaws 25 times to get that shark right. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, uh, when Spielberg made the re-release of, of E.T. for the 20th anniversary in 2002, which, oh my God. Uh, yeah, he, he famously, he replaced the rifles with walkie-talkies. Walkie yeah, because again, like he's, <sighs> he's, he's an older man. He has a lot of kids. He's a father. And like, he's like, there are no reason for these guns to be here. He course corrected that though, right? He said he regretted having made that change. And also not only that, but even when they released the new version on DVD, they released it with the original theatrical cut. Good. 
And yes, you're right. In recent years has said that he, he thinks that that was a mistake and he should have left it alone. Something else really interesting about Spielberg that I think sheds a lot of light on something we've been talking about is he says, Steven Spielberg says, the one movie he's made that he, he doesn't feel like he could make the same way now is Close Encounters of the Third Kind because at the end of the movie, Richard Dreyfus leaves his family and goes into space inside the mothership to go on some crazy adventure. And he's like, today, I couldn't make a movie where the father leaves his family at the end. Sure. And it makes sense because, you know, in 1977, he didn't have kids. Right. Yeah. But he also didn't go back and change the end end though. He left it alone. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying, though, is that, like, you grow as a person and then your your thinking creatively changes. So when you stay with the same project, you're thinking about it changes as you change. You're thinking about what's right or wrong changes as you evolve as a person. So when George Lucas says, it's always been my intention to do X, Y, Z, I think from his subjective viewpoint, that's true because he's seeing it from his point of view and from his perspective, he's still the same guy with the same intentions. And so it's it's just sort of like, no, like this is what I was always trying to do, not realizing the execution of it is completely other than how he would have done it 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And it's funny because I feel like in some way, I mean, as consumers, everyone takes ownership of the thing they consume and stuff like that. And we as Star Wars fans who are now going into middle age, basically, we have to give up our toys too. Right. Like uh, when it right. comes to the sequels and stuff like that, we have to give up our toys too, you know? And I remember um, Mark Hamill talks about this with The Last Jedi. You know, He's like, I fundamentally disagreed with the way they took the direction of Luke Skywalker. He's like, however, this isn't my story anymore. It's the new generation story. And he's like, and I am now a vehicle to tell that story. So it's like, it's just going to keep going on without us. And I feel like there's a similarity between the aging Star Wars fans and George Lucas, because George Lucas, like I said, was sell selling LucasArts to Disney and regretting that decision. It's like, at some point, you got to get, you have to let the kids play with your toys, <laughs> you know? Because if you keep holding them for yourselves, it's like, then it kind of loses the, um, yeah, I don't know. It's not the word I'm looking for. But basically, I think it's just more beneficial to just let it be. Like Spielberg let Close Encounters be. And he, now when he makes his new movies, they might have the opposite message. Francis Ford Coppola does not go back and make mm. Vietnam. But like, mm. no, I'm trying to, no, he, he goes back with, with, with Godfather 3, but Godfather 3 was known as a disappointment when it came out. A movie yeah. like Apocalypse Now was not a disappointment. So can you imagine if he went back to Apocalypse Now? Oh, he did change he Apocalypse did. Now. He did. He there did. you go. But I was going to say, but like to change the tone of the movie, but I think he did. He did he do did. it, George Lucas. He did. Yeah, he did. I take you, you you your own point, point, Johnny. He went back to two different movies more than George Lucas. I take it all back. I take it all back. <laughs> One last thing I wanted to bring up because I found it really fascinating. I had a conversation with the fan editor, Hal 9000, who has done a bunch of fan edits of the Star Wars movies, of all of them, actually. But one of the things that he said that I found super fascinating was he's a few years younger than us. So he recounts when he was a kid, when he went to the video store and saw Star Wars on the shelf, there were always more than one version of it. There was the original versions and the special edition versions. So from his perspective, Star Wars already existed as these multiple versions with all of these changes and everything. So that's always how he knew Star Wars was a movie that was changed and and played around with, which I thought that's was also, urgent behavior. But that's also it, highly unique yes. to his generation. Because yeah. before him and after him, it's not. Before him, we had the originals and then we had the options. So we, we were used to the originals, right? He right. grew up with always having the option. And now the younger generations, they only have the new ones. Like they can't go back and watch the original versions. So he's a very unique case. Yeah, which I just... I thought it was a very fascinating thing that I hadn't, that had never occurred to me. The idea that, that for him, Star Wars was always something that's constantly revised mm. and revisited and, and sort of tinkered with, I thought maybe, was a really interesting insight. Oh, uh, yeah, mm. no, I, I found that fascinating. I, I think also maybe he was, uh, uh, maybe he is, uh, was the first or original 
uh, because of the uh, the times in which he entered the Star Wars era. But now, like remixing is just it is the way we culturally communicate. Yeah, I mean, meme culture at its most kind of kind of elemental particle. That is the way we communicate. It's like through these clips of of other material. Hmm. Which upon further inspection of that, you realize that's how we've always communicated. Yes. Yeah. Right. But what's also funny about that is that even in meme culture, at least with someone like myself, you remember like a funny video and you, you show it around and you're like, oh, let me find that video. And you can't find the original video on YouTube because like 50,000 other people have remixed it or re-edited it or put their stupid yeah. commentary on it. It's like, I just want the original video and you can't find it. And it's like history is repeating itself, but like on a much, much, much smaller scale, you know? It's like, where is that original cat video? I don't want to see 50 remixes of it. I want to see the original video. So basically what I'm trying to say is uh, go watch the Lion Chair, lionchairmovie.com. And, um... <laughs> oh, we didn't, oh, we didn't talk about it, but, and I feel like I, I mentioned this in an, uh, another podcast, but I feel like uh, upon reflection of the special editions and how I feel about it today, Breezy looks back at the special editions and again sees uh, how we started to talk about it in college as kind of some of the the kernels that led to the lion share. Like it started this like conversation of like, why is he changing this? Like who owns this? The conversation mm -hmm. of like, oh, I started this. I have ownership versus the people who received that and decided that they ran with it. And, and uh, honestly, I mean, a uh, lion share is an exploration of meme culture before meme culture became culture. It's a bare fact. It's a bare fact. Oh, so that's crazy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's about how ideas travel and change. Yeah. Yeah, the movie's about that. It's about George Lucas not letting go of his goddamn idea. It's what I said from day <laughs> one. It's what I've always said about the lion's share. It's about I, George Lucas. I would, I've always said who I've who always wouldn't want to hang out with George Lucas for a day, man? Just to pick his yeah. brain. And Plenty of people, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but like, not even, yeah. to, not even to talk about Star Wars, just to hang out. See what type Who of wouldn't man? want to hang out with a billionaire? Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think that about sums it up. Well, I want to thank my guests, John and Bracey. And if you like what you heard, please go to trashcompod.com and you can rate and review the show and find Trash Compod across all social media. And, Jesus, um, Josh. Yeah. I always screw it up at the end. I dislike how that's the ending now is you just fucking up the end. <laughs>